Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Method in Madness, episode 13. Welcome. Uh, this is a series of uh, webinars that we are arranging and organizing at Joy of Drama. We curate uh, a webinar every weekend uh, for all of you who are watching us, especially parents and teachers. Um, well, what is Method in Madness? Now, uh, we do send our children to uh, music class and art-based classes and drama classes uh, and theater uh, you know, workshops. And uh, we wonder what happens in there, don't we? Uh, we really don't know what happens in there. All we can hear from outside as parents is a lot of noise or pin, pin drop silence. So um, this webinar or this series of webinar is um, to uncape what lies beneath. What do these drama teachers and what do these art-based programs actually do? Uh, this will help us understand, go deeper into the benefits that art and art-based work has um, in learning uh, and teaching at the same time. So we have a lot of teachers with us also today and every webinar. There, uh, there are many of you who have been joining us regularly thank you so much for joining in uh, because uh, teachers uh, uh, need uh, this kind of um, an opening where they can converse with fellow teachers uh, and with parents so thank you so much again all of you for joining us today we have a very interesting topic and the topic is how does literature shape a child we have been um, reading uh, since we, are, we were very young in, in school. Some of us kept reading and some of us just uh, had, uh, had read a few and then stopped reading, started watching movies, started uh, watching plays, started listening to music rather than reading movie, uh, books. Uh, but what is literature? And can we, can we see literature beyond books? Um, is there a way uh, to indulge in literature with our children uh, at home or at school in a different way to help us understand and go deep into literature and uh, children's literature and how to look at it and how to give it um, a perspective which uh, we know about, but we don't really go deep into it. So let's welcome Shalini Pattabhiraman. Shalini. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Shalini is an educator and a poet, and she's joining us from Scotland. Uh, Shalini is, uh, has been my friend for a very, very long time. We have known each other for last 10 years. And um, uh, an amazing soul, a great spirit, and uh, she brought in the spirit of literature and uh, how literature can transform a child uh, into my life. And I owe everything uh, to, to your uh, guidance, uh, Shalini. You have been a great uh, support and a great friend all through these years. Uh, like Shalini... <laughs> Yeah, Shalini likes, I really like this thing about her that when she uh, was, uh, we were just having a conversation, she likes all the words with P, pebbles, <laughs> poetry, process drama, paintings, and play. Yes. So today we'll talk about play, Shalini, aren't we? To some extent, yes. To some extent. Good words, yes. So uh, Shalini, thank you for joining us. And... Uh, uh, We'll have a conversation for the next one hour now to just let all our um, uh, viewers know that Shalini and I are going to talk for the next 40 minutes and then we are going to take your questions which you can put down on your comment section. Uh, so please keep sharing your comments and your questions as we uh, talk and then at around 7.45 we are going to start taking your questions for another 15 minutes. So yes, Shalini, let us begin. Okay. So Shalini, um, you have been a, a drama in education teacher for, for a very long time. 
and uh, you have used uh, drama not just to teach uh, literature but uh, to teach life so literature and life they kind of go hand in hand absolutely how do you how do you see that we want to hear it from you um to put it very simply any story that we hear is a story that belongs to the world it belongs to an individual so when we read a story we always relate to stories because we sometimes imagine ourselves as the protagonist or as another character and we pick up things and pieces that resonate with us so in that sense uh, literature is a mirror of of what we see in our environment and when we think about that we realize that because literature is talking about us and is talking about the things that exist around us it is it is um therefore a stimulus to what life offers us whether in the shape of problems whether in the shape of uh questions whether in the shape of um ideas so the so the ability of literature to to enthuse an audience and take them to different directions is enormous and life skills are just about everything that we do whether we are having a conversation right now that is a life skill comprehending something is a life skill being able to articulate a question and ask that is a life skill the ability to negotiate meaning out of symbols is a life skill so if you think about it all these things can be inspired and stimulated through literature because it's a mirror to the society i hope that kind of answers the question <laughs> yeah it does it does absolutely um what about empathy shalini because what i i have seen is that uh, since childhood whatever i would read um i would like to apply whatever i read uh, in my real life so if i if i read a a a story which uh, had a very kind man or did something very nice and kind to someone i would try that out and and see how it feels uh, and try to match my feeling to that person's feeling uh in the character's feeling in the book hmm. so i i have always i think i've learned empathy through books uh how do you how do you kind of uh, gauge that like where does empathy come in and how can one um you know actively participate in uh, in exercising empathy i think it's a very good question vishali uh because if you think about it all stories are based on a conflict and wherever there is conflict there is emotion and wherever there is emotion there will be a sense of um it is going to inspire things inside us when we read it so empathy is a nat- natural uh, byproduct of reading as a process and often what happens is that when we read a story and during the process of reading we are extremely involved with everything that is happening and sometimes we don't take that empathy a notch further we finish the story and it ends there so what happens is that when you when we use let's say a stimulus in a drama classroom for example and we say oh this particular boy is going on a boat and he lands up uh, getting stuck because there is a problem in the boat maybe it's it's got a hole or something and you know it's going to capsize what are we going to do so that empathy allows us to problem solve and negotiate a solution so in the drama process we indulge by jumping into the drama space jumping into the story and negotiating a meaning there and problem solving there but if you think about it in a different fashion so let's say in a school environment where you're not doing a drama based lesson how would you negotiate empathy how would you deal with it so i would say let's say for example i i recently finished a teaching with my uh, secondary students um a book that was written in the 1930s of m- mice and men how does that relate to us today if you think about it uh during that time people faced the great depression it was a financial slump that continued for years and if you consider the lockdown situation now 
uh, you will realize that uh, we will all realize that um, that same dynamic is repeating itself in our current context. So literature allows us to think about these aspects of what happened then, how people approach certain uh, situations at that point in time. It teaches us a lot, which is why history is also his story. At the end of the day, all stories allow us to learn something from it and then eventually apply it uh, in the real context. So empathy is part of that structure. You cannot subtract it. Uh, yes, but that, that means that, uh, uh, you know, when we read a book, there has to be a conversation around the book, like teachers Absolutely. do it in the classroom. You know, teachers, usually literature teachers, English language teachers, they do it in classroom. Uh, sure. But uh, could be, you know, time constraints or, you know, uh, you know the, the urgency to finish a, a lesson or finish a syllabus can keep them from taking or extending the conversations. So... Uh, where do you think uh, a parent can play a role over here? Uh, how do we bring in conversations which, you know, are longer, you know, for longer duration? Okay, that's a very good question. And uh, Shashwat, if you could allow us to look at the slide, then we can get started with that. Um, yeah. There are many different ways to start a conversation. So when we are reading... Uh, a book and I will relate this example with a picture book because um, I think it's easier to demonstrate this concept with a picture book but this does apply to all kinds of literature okay so this is a story uh, this is a picture it's an image taken from a book called Bear and Bird and this is by Gwen uh, Millard and in this particular story, the bird goes out looking for her friend, the bear, who's gone to collect sticks because they've run out of uh, sticks and it's the height of winter. So prediction is something that we engage in as teachers when we are reading a story to, to young people. So the process of asking questions is, is uh, divided into two parts. The first part is what is immediate, what is factual. So we ask questions like, what do you see? What is happening right now? Who do you see there in this picture? What do you think they are thinking? So these are all factual things which we um, kind of take out the meaning looking at the picture. So we draw the meaning from the picture by looking at it um, directly. But then comes the second range of of questions, which is, why do you think something like this happened? Where could they go to, in order to, to find the bear? Where could the bear possibly be in, in the winter condition? If he's gone out for so long, would he be OK? Now, these are questions which we are directing at the children. And by directing at the children, we are inviting them to predict the story, to tell the story from their own point of view. And why is that integral to the, uh, to the act of storytelling and reading is that uh, prediction allows us to, to carry the story forward. And in carrying the story forward, we are building upon the imagination. We are allowing children to process things on their own. And by asking these questions, which are who, what, where, when, why, how, uh, we are allowing children to analyze the information that is in front of them. So they're looking at the basics, which are the facts, and then they're allowing their own analysis to uh, build a second picture, a, a second stage into the story. So prediction is a very important aspect. And allowing children to do that is, is, is great for them. Next, when the prediction comes true, there is a lot of acknowledgement that comes into four. So you understand and see that children will suddenly beam with happiness when the prediction comes right. Come to true. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, also, I think that it doesn't just end with prediction as an as, as a as a byproduct, you also see that when we are reading a story and we're engaging with it, automatically our schemas come into place. So what are schemas? If you could just, I mean, 
if you could just explain so, all of uh, our structure. You have the slide, please. So let's yeah, see. Yeah. We'll play a little game here if that helps, Vaishali. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, can can our viewers also play this along with us? Yes, absolutely. So it'll be a all little right. more fun than just me talking all the time. Okay. All right. So here are two images. This is uh, these images have been taken from a book called The Flower, mm -hmm. and it is written by John Light. And they're beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous illustrations by Lisa Evans. So if you look at the first picture, the first image, which is on the left hand side, can the viewers give me five words that describe this image or the emotions that are there in this image? Five words. Okay. Five words that describe this image. Uh or the emotions that are there in the image. Okay, so all of you can type your five words down on the comment section below so that uh, Shalini and I can take a look. I'm just checking on my phone how many words we have got. All right. Uh, and uh, the next, is there anything else that we need to do? So, when you do this, what is happening is that um, your automatic, your brain is automatically sending signals. It is interpreting the image in its own way. Hmm. Can we have a look at what are the words that uh, people have sent in there, Shali? Till now, I mean, I think they're all writing. Okay, can you give me a word, Vaishali, just to get started? I will give you a word, uh, gloom. I can, gloom. I can give you a word, gloom. Now, yeah. That is first schema in your head okay, okay. So that first link that first association now if i ask you what led you to think about gloom um the the gray um excellent silhouette the gray you're silhouette of you're, yeah. associating, you're linking that idea you're associating it with the color gray yes so when we look at images when we look at words we the brain is automatically sending us signals that relate to other ideas and other concepts mm -hmm. we are always thinking in terms of a schema in terms of a um that if i say tree automatically people can visualize the branch the trunk of the tree the so basically a scheme of things a scheme of thoughts excellent yes that's a nice right. way to Okay. So, All right. in terms of playing games now, I often play mm -hmm. a game called Arthur's Game, where uh, you can give a word to a person and ask them to think about all words that describe that, or all words associated with that. So, in terms of a mm -hmm. tree, your associated words are birds' nest, uh, leaves, trunk, so on and so forth. But in terms of description, it would be green, tall, big, magical, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Like that, we develop the schematic um, process for children. If we play games like this, using images, using words, we develop this particular skill in the students. And this obviously can be extended further. So in a way, you could say this is like a reverse mind map. So when you mm -hmm. teach children mind mapping, when you teach children, um, you know, how to... Uh, to conceptualize ideas, this is the rudiment of it. This is the foundation of it. Mm. I've got many have uh, just commented. If I can read them out to you. Sure. sure. Uh, so Urna is writing busy, gloomy, lost and urban. Beautiful words. Absolutely stunning. Now, can you see the diversity of these words that have come forth? Mm. Um, uh, you know, so this allows us to to see that people will bring in different concepts, different ideas. Now, the urban space is such a beautiful texture to jump into for drama. And yes. if you contrast it with the rural space, what exists there? Now, mm. Shashwat, go to the next slide. This is where conversation starters come in. What is the difference mm. between rural and urban? What is the difference between happiness and gloom? Mm. Now, here's this... Um, we are going back to the same story, uh, which is bear and bird. So bear uh, is still missing and bird is out looking for bear. And here's in this particular image, uh, the bird flashes, beams this light up 
up to a tree to look for, for bear. Now, what kind of conversation starters can we have? Are they only story related or text related? And here I would like to say that stories can lead to many other conversations that we have not even imagined and that do not necessarily need to relate to the story or the text. So for yeah. example, when this bird is beaming the flashlight, I could ask, I could propose a question, a problem. Why is it that the torch always beams a light that goes in a triangular shape? And that's a question for the viewers. Can you think of why it happens? Oh, oh, those who are uh, physics lovers or physics uh, people, please write down the answer. We need to know the answer <laughs> before we close today. Why this, uh, yeah, uh, takes a triangular or conical shape. Yeah. And for, for all you know, you know if, if you're working with younger children, they don't have to be phys uh, physics uh, specialists or science uh, nerds, you know, to answer this question. They could actually take a flashlight, experiment with it, try things out and come to their own discoveries related to shadow and light and how it yeah. works. At least, you've, you know, you've made that, uh, you know, uh, you sowed that sweet, uh, seed into their yeah. mind of, of, of how to look. I think how to look is something which uh, we can talk about further. Uh, like when you're reading uh, a text, you know, uh, hmm. what to look at and how to look at it. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. Do, do you want me to keep this or can I just get it out? Yeah. All yeah. right. Okay. We so, can, um, we can. If you're looking at a picture book, the illustrations mm -hmm. are a great source of, of conversation. Because yes. often in a picture book, you will realize that the written text does not always communicate all the action that is happening in the pictures. Hmm. And in fact, there are many picture books which have no words or very few words in them. So there's yes. a fantastic picture book called uh, Journey. Jeremy, can you show it? Uh, uh, I, can, you, uh, can you just take the slide off? This is yeah. the book, okay? And if okay. you look at this particular book, um, it has absolutely no words throughout the book. No words at all. But it tells an amazing story about a journey. Yeah? Mm. So there is a classic, classic story, uh, Rosie's Walk by Pat Hutchins. And most of the story is in the pictures. It is not in the text. So interacting with the text is not enough. You've got to interact with the pictures. You've got to get the children to look at what is happening. For example, Rosie the hen went for a walk. But who else it, was there? There's so much to say. There was a fox. So this is just a, uh, an example. It doesn't yeah. have to be limited to picture books. So when we look at young adult fiction, for example, there's a lot of symbolism which exists, a lot of meaning that is uh, referred to through symbols. Yeah. So yes. when we talk about interpretation, negotiating a meaning out of something, then it is about finding the schema again and trying to make meaning by attaching significance to that source. So the words that have come up in your list, try and see how they are linked, how they're associated, how, and how, they, can be, how they can be presented to another person yeah. because that becomes then your unique um, creation. Yeah. So you have understood something and you've created something new. And this process is a natural process if we discuss literature often. If we talk about things from the story, if we talk about ideas from the story and we um, begin to see other things happening around the story, then we will develop new things out of the story, not just the story. Yeah? Yes. And that's what actually literature does. It opens doors for you. It opens doors to, to think and, and look out and move and, and explore. 
so literature when we look at literature definitely there are stories and there are story books and novels and novellas and there is poetry and you are a poet uh shalini and I'm and fine. i must tell everybody who is watching us you must must visit shalini's uh, facebook page it's called Nimb- nimbus equations <laughs> and uh, she my instagram shalini patel and it, uh, yeah and instagram also and she takes one she clicks wonderful photographs and writes beautiful poetry poetry that's um that's another love uh, of mine and uh, somewhere i feel poetry um does a lot more to you than story can do uh please I, enlighten us on that i think i think for me personally uh poetry is is the shortest form of a story and it's the highest form of telling a story as well because it uses such few words to tell a story of course there are writers who have written pages and pages of poetry that also exists but on the whole you know if you look at poems for children especially those that were written uh, for a younger audience you'll realize that there is just so much drama that is happening so i'll share a favorite of mine it's called slinky malinky and it's written by lynn lee dodd and's been converted into a picture book and if you google it up you might find um um an animated version of the story as well okay yeah. so slinky malinky was blacker than black a stalking and lurking adventurous cat with bright yellow eyes a warbling whale and a kink at the end of his very long tail he was cheeky and cheerful friendly and fun he chased after leaves and he'd roll in the sun but at night he was wicked and fiendish and sly through moonlight and shadow he'd prowl and he'd pry he crept along fences leaned to the walls he poked into corners and sneaked into holes what was he up to at night to be brief slinky malinky turned into a thief and i'll stop there <laughs> as you can see there's just so much happening in this poem isn't it yes. even if you didn't have it in the shape of a picture book if you just heard it if you just listened to it or if you just read it just the words mm. you can mm. imagine this particular cat and you love cats so you would know how amazingly it captures the essence and spirit of cats yes yeah yeah um so there this uh, i mean imagery is definitely there in in poetry definitely. and and uh, it actually when you read a poem it actually you know pushes you to go and and break the text and you know uh, look at the image instead uh how well do you think poetry as a literature or a literary form uh mm-hmm. help a child develop um develop a, another way of looking and perceiving uh life around him or her um in simple terms it's a way of expressing ideas so yeah. just like we read a story in 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 a picture book or in a young adult um novel similarly in a poem also you begin to see the shape of narratives now if it is a narrative poem you will see the the characters talking you will have some speech involved there but if you're looking at a descriptive poem or a lyrical poem as it is called you will begin to see the emotional aspects how does one feel about it so here i would like to um point to a poem which is again one of my favorites called you can't be that so if shashat could show us the poem then i could read a little bit to explain why i brought this particular poem in here and why i i personally love this poem so much uh not this one not this one the other one so this poem written by brian patton is a poem that 
as the title suggests, does something to an audience. So let's have a look. I told them, when I grow up, I'm not going to be a scientist or someone with, um, sorry, it's kind of tiny for me to read, but I will try. Or someone who reads the news on TV. No, a million birds will fly through me. I'm going to be a tree, they said. You can't be that. No, you can't be that. We'll stop there. So as you can see, the context here is about where can our imagination take us? And what are we allowed to do? And what are we not allowed to do when our imagination leads us? And there is obviously a different section of people, whether it's parents, teachers, or our peers also sometimes, who will say, you can't do that. You mm. can't do that. And that is so limiting. It is so uh, restrictive. So the fact that poetry can also engage in, uh, in showing us our emotions and how we feel at certain times is the thing that draws me to poetry so much. The fact that it allows people to see exactly how I might have felt if someone said that to me. You can't be that. You can't do that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, but Shalini, you know... Uh, because it's such a short format, yes. there is so much to explore in terms of themes, in terms of ideas, in terms of problems, in terms of negotiating meaning. And so much to learn from the way language can be um, used creatively. Because, because this is such a short format of writing, the imagery obviously pulls you into a completely different uh, environment. And it does it faster than a novel would land up doing. So within the space of five minutes, you're transported into the character's world, into the yes. speaker's world, the persona's yeah. world. Absolutely. Uh, what we do um, uh, at our, uh, you know, in, in our sessions when we work with poetry, and I, I really love working with poetry uh, with children of any age. I mean, even with older children, I usually start with, uh, you know, a sonnet because sonnets are again the shortest uh, stories and plays that uh, you know people have written. Uh, but, you know, for you and me and teachers of English language uh, or teachers who are uh, invested in parents who are, are invested in literature or, uh, or they're involved in, in, in literature in some or the other way, it is easier. Uh, but there are, there are many who... Uh, um, I something here. I, yes. think, I think half the time people think of poetry as being something... That's what. They cannot... Can Accept. Can, we can we demystify that, uh, Shalini, for our uh, parents that poetry is not a not something that you cannot, uh, you know, do or read or enjoy. Please, um, I want I, your. I feel, I, I, I feel that it is it is basically a problem that has come because of how we teach poetry. So I remember that I was probably in the third standard or something when I was growing up. You know uh, that I came across. Um, upon Westminster Bridge by Wordsworth. Mm. And while I obviously had a love for words and I came from a family who enjoyed words and I could, I could get something from that poem, it is a tough thing to negotiate when you're just eight. Mm. And before you even begin to understand the texture of language and sounds, if you indulge in imagery, it doesn't work. Okay. So I think the first thing that anybody needs to do is to enjoy the texture and shape of words. So when I say sweet, it is sweet because of the long sound E that is in that word. If I say, for example, um, gigantic, you can see how much you have to negotiate the texture of the word gigantic that allows us to feel the words the rhythm in it the shape of of the vowels in it and 
playing with sounds is the best way to get into poetry so if if you were to play something okay i could i could do like a little thing with just you vaishali okay because uh, and uh, and the viewers can do it in their homes with each other okay so let's say there is a beat okay so okay. um i say um something like um birds in the sky birds in the sky flutter and fly flutter and fly birds in the sky can you come up mm. with a chant for me a chant yep i'll give you the beat okay bees in the meadow bees in the mm. meadow s- sting and fall sting and fall bees in bees in the meadow so you see the mm. moment you begin to give this rhyme and rhythm plays a role it allows us to think of so many different things and if you try this game out at home and you experiment with it i can sh- assure you that everyone will have their own little chant that they can come can, up with can 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 i try yes please go ahead okay cat on the mat mat on the cat cat on the mat on the hat on the cat <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't have to follow the rhythm structure that i offered you but you created you yeah know, yes you know this yeah. now this is the basics of poetry rhyme and rhythm then come the images the action the description so poetry is not really high fi it is not something which is just <laughs> it is very very simple and the most beautiful poetry is often the simplest of poetry of poems yeah it it yeah. it doesn't have to be uh, abstract that has its own place i'm not saying that that, that doesn't offer us value it, it 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 has its own place you know but Uh, poetry for young children is absolutely fun they play the writers have played with the language they've played with the images they've played with the context and it's just absolute fun I and mean, if you read yeah. this, this another favorite poem um um jack prelutsky is a writer who i absolutely love he is so funny so funny yes he's very he funny has, <laughs> you can look at the liverpool Six. poets uh all three of them adrian henry um um brian patton and roger mcgough um mm. they are just brilliant they're just brilliant they have so much fun michael rosen is absolutely michael rosen is up is, and he he has and, uh, I'm, i'm quoting poets who are um from the west but if we were yeah. to look at even even our own regional literature you know even our um own own regional stories and poems I uh, remember when we were chatting about this doing this thing I told you about uh that that poem that I remember I used to read out to my son um uh, I don't have the book incidentally so I don't you know it's been at least 10 years my son is turning 10 so it's been at least 10 years since I've read that poem uh to myself um I I can I can just remember a few lines go But you know what ha uh, ha uh, Leo kahalla subah subah jag gaya sara mohalla So can you see the richness of the of the texture here you, you can immediately imagine the color the character that the energy in that particular mohalla in that particular space yeah. so it doesn't have to be limited to just english it can be in your own language it can be in the regional uh, languages that you indulge in and and celebrate those languages celebrate the storytelling the writing the reading in those languages yeah because in in bengali we have something i mean i i think it is in all languages but we call it chhora or chhand yes. uh, yeah so i i mean we have uh, the series of books written by ramanand tagore for uh, young children called shahaj path which is like sahaj path uh-huh. and and there are couplets you know he has written couplets so that we remember the sound we remember the rhythm we remember the texture that each syllable makes you know each sound makes hmm. and uh, i i have seen children who have no idea of what it means saying it and mm-hmm. enjoying just the sound of it so i think um, looking at regional poetry or, um, you know poetry for the young uh, which is introduced even when they you know when they have still not uh, you know uh, understood language or 
cannot make words or cannot form sentences and they still don't are always, sorry to interrupt vaishali yeah. but don't you sing nonsense rhymes when there is a baby in front of us yes yes i used to sing this nonsense rhyme forever and my son still laughs at me when i sing it to him magulichi bam bam gudiya tam tam gamagali gam gam gachi magadam dam nonsense absolute gibberish but can you see the rhythm in it and the fun yeah. in it Yeah. and and as a baby the, the child automatically listens to that uh, phonemic yeah. texture of the language yeah. and gurgles along with it yeah. enjoys it so Enjoy children it. absorb sounds and if we nurture that that ability of children to negotiate sounds to read meaning into the texture of the sound we will give them a love for words and for rhyme and for rhythm and for poetry and then poetry need not be only rhyming poetry it can yeah. move on to free verse and it can move on to some abstract ideas as well but you need to enjoy words first yeah. play with words first how scary is this uh it's treading on this zone of imagination because uh there are many children who uh completely get glued to their books so i know many um children who love reading books and they love reading so much that they will not read anything else they will keep you know they'll hide a little story book in inside their normal regular textbook and read it carry story books to school uh, <laughs> i know you have done that <laughs> but but there are children who just want to get immersed in the world of books and not interact not actively participate in 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 you know socially uh, outside books uh how do we check that or when is it that a parent or a, or a teacher should start getting a little concerned uh, with this i think if a child is reading a book um it's it's a space where he or she is is already immersed so pulling them out of that zone when they are so absorbed is a disrespect to that particular person i feel this is my personal uh, opinion yeah? yeah um but obviously we understand that if children uh, cannot balance reading with other things like playing outdoors or or say for example they have a test coming up and they need to obviously spend a little bit of time practicing for that um there has to be some balance so i think that's a conversation for parents to or teachers to indulge in and 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 to ask people to use logic and reasoning to 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 manage that but to stop the process of reading i i i, I still think it's it's a bit disrespectful because in that space in that world they are doing loads of things like we've just discussed they are thinking they're imagining they're problem solving perhaps in their own head space they are creating ideas of their own as well they are they are constructing things and i don't think we should um, allow disrupt that process what do you say yourself yeah i think uh, there should be a, a a fair way or a or an, a rather intelligent way to involve Uh, ourselves. If I'm a, uh, ourselves, like if I'm a parent, then I should, uh, if if and my daughter is not talking to me and is immersed in in her book, then I'll find a way to interact with her. Maybe pick up a book uh, by the same author that she's reading and read it, and then and then at the dinner table maybe start a conversation uh, on. Uh, yeah. yeah, you have been reading his books. What do you think? I think. this is what he's been you know trying to say in this particular story what is it saying in your story so uh, i would do that find a find a nice um, even if you've not, not read the book for example yeah um, yeah if you have a genuine interest remember children no pretense when it is if you're just pretending yes. to ask a question <laughs> so if it's a genuine interest they will automatically indulge in that they will automatically stop reading and they will um attend to your question mm. and sometimes it's good because when they are working with your question they are beginning to see something else that they may not have seen 
So remember, a conversation is not just about uh, my perspective and let's just, I said this, I said that, you know, so it's, it's, it's not just that. It's about allowing the different colors, the different range of ideas to come through, which is why you, you had, uh, what was your word, Vaishali? Could you remind me? Um, gloom. Gloom no. and urban space. What is, what is close between those two? Nothing. They're so miles apart. But when you put those two ideas together, then a completely different narrative comes, comes in front of us. So that is what we need to do, that when we ask questions, we, we need to see the different range of um, ideas that we could work around with. So conversations have to be genuine. They can't be just, let me just ask for the sake of asking something. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I agree to that. Because the children have this innate, innate, innate sense of uh, understanding whether, uh, whether my mother or my teacher is really interested in me or not. Absolutely. So, yeah, so they, they will catch you if you're not. <laughs> so, yeah, that's something that's example. For to... example, you know, yeah. when, when my son is always going back to his favorite book, which is Diary of a Wimpy Kid, he does read other things and he loves nonfiction. He reads a lot of nonfiction, a lot of instructional literature, like, for example, how to make a dinosaur out of, he, he loves yeah. origami. He does lots of folding and he, he reads a lot of books on origami. So if you think about this, he is immersed in that zone. And if I go and tell him, uh, Kalhan, I need you to, you know, uh, uh, do something else, mm. it stops his flow. So it's, 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 it's not right. The second thing is that if I genuinely go and ask him, uh, Kalhan, um, I like what you're making, you know, this, this dinosaur is coming, but it looks very complex to me. Can you show me how to do it? Then what you're doing is you're inviting him to participate in recounting what he has absorbed. And in, in teaching, which is, again, a different level of using language, using ideas, um, applying their knowledge. So I think doing that is essential that when you go into that space with them uh, there has to be a genuine need for something to happen which means that you need to spend the next half an hour one hour yes making that making yeah, that thing. Mm. yeah shalini where do you see literature going because uh, not many are into books these days uh where do you see it going? Is it is it something that we should be kind of bothered that children are not reading anymore? Or is there something else that we can look at, which is a healthy alternative? I think, I think uh, books as we know them mm. are not the only format in which literature is being accessed. So literature... First of all, we must debunk the idea that literature is only fiction. Literature includes a whole range of, of, of things. So your non-fictional books, your news articles, your um, instruct manuals, everything is literature, isn't it? It's all part of, part of that same uh, wider space of text. And yeah. these days, if you look at it, text is no longer just words on a piece of paper. Text is visual. Text is dynamic. Uh, it's multimodal because it's not just on one platform, which is this. It is taking on many different platforms to, to, to present the same idea. So text is evolving in a fashion that... Um, teachers and parents also need to um, kind of catch up with that same pace and evolve with it. So I think that multimodal dynamic is what currently hooks children and a younger audience into literature. It invites them in. If it is um, multimodal, it doesn't mean that they're not reading into the meaning. So my son watches a lot of... Um, videos online like uh, Austin Stevens or someone like that who catches snakes. And once he's done that, 
I know there's a book on snakes that he would definitely, definitely want to read. And so it's it's kind of vice versa. So he had this book. He goes to those videos. He gets some more information. Then he goes somewhere. He finds another book. He goes back to it. So it's kind of, it's, it's informing him. Yeah. It's merging. It's igniting. It's stimulating. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that reading is not going to be in this fashion alone. Reading is going to happen on our mobiles. It's going to happen um, on the TV screens. It's going to happen in many different formats. Perhaps like formats watching, formats. like like watching plays. If you if you don't yep. want to read yep. a play, go watch it. Yep, absolutely. You're on the ball there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, we are uh, almost uh, ten. You know, yeah. We overshot 10 minutes with our conversation. Time to take uh, time to take questions from our uh, viewers. Uh, many I have received so many comments. Thank you so much, everybody, for commenting. Um, okay, um, there's a question from Yogesh. Uh, are we ready to take questions, Shalini? Yes, yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Yogesh is asking. Uh, school children do not take interest in poetry maybe because of the figures of speech or say because of its rich but difficult vocabulary. In that case, how can we make them move towards poetry? Can you give some tips on this? Start with simple stuff. Start with poetry which is fun rather than boring. So play around with... Um, language first with words first like i like i demonstrated with the chant the rhyme and rhythm games that we can uh, negotiate with or or if you could look at um picture books which are also poetry like slinky malinky if you're working with younger children if you're working with let's say a secondary student and and they are not interested in poetry i would again bring in a fun poem first i would bring in a poem that they could relate to so you can't be that has always been received so well amongst my uh, students because it, it really appeals to their idea that, you know, nobody wants to listen to what I want to say. Mm. Everybody's trying to throw ideas at me. And automatically, it's not just that you're making an inroad into poetry as a genre, but you're also building a relationship with your children when you or your students when you when you have fun with them, when you play with them. So I think it is essential to do simpler and fun stuff before we go to the darker and the gloomier and the uh, more abstract stuff. Does that help answer your question, Yogesh? I, I hope it does. I hope it does. Uh, Neetu is asking, in fact, she is asking whether we agree uh, if there is a vast difference between reading and understanding? Definitely. That's a very good question, Neetu. Um, you can read something, which means you have the ability to read, but cognition or comprehension is a completely different dynamic. So for example, uh, let's say I, I don't know anything about rugby or baseball, and I read a news article about the game and how players have played that. I can read it, but I will not understand a single thing that is happening there because I don't have the context to understand that. So comprehension is a different level of, under, of, of, of the process of cognition. So reading is just first part. The ability to see the words and making sense is the second part. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, it does. So it's it's important, comprehension. It is important to, to understand the context and the and the environment in which that text belongs if you want to comprehend it better. Yeah. And I think, Shalini, um, that comprehension also uh, kind of differs from age to age. In a, dif in a particular age, Obviously. Yeah. there comes my cat. Yes. Everybody can see oh, her. Cute. That's Zebun Nessa. We call her Zebu. <laughs> Lovely name. So, um, so I feel like you know, if you read the same text now, and if you read, uh, and you have read it 
uh, say uh, five years ago, uh, the meaning changes for you because you have moved on in your life. You have gathered more experience as a person. True. True. And I think I think that is that is uh, that should be taken into consideration when you're uh, it, you know you're involving in a conversation about comprehension uh, with your child because what you comprehend as an adult may not be uh, what the child uh, you know can comprehend or or is able to comprehend. Uh, um, what do you have to say about that? I agree with you that uh, at different age groups, people will respond mm -hmm. to different uh, to the same idea differently. Mm -hmm. So that's a given because our maturity levels are different. Mm -hmm. However, we cannot say that those those questions that I am grappling with as an adult. Let's take the example of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So if I have questions regarding the lockdown and the emotions that are overwhelming me. Um, we cannot say that those same sort of questions or those same sort of emotions will not be overwhelming a younger child. In their own fashion, at their own level, those same dynamics will apply to them as well. So I think when we are talking about um, questions or when we are talking about comprehending a text, we can take a news article and have a discussion with the child, but obviously the child doesn't have to read that article if they're younger. So yeah. you can take ideas from there. You can take impressions and concepts that they can grapple with and, and have a conversation around that. Uh, but because you are the parent, because you're the teacher, you would know your child best and you would know at which level uh, they will be able to understand it or not. So speak at the child's level, uh, not not at your level. Um, and and a very I mean, as drama teacher, you would know that when you work with younger children, you never stand and speak. You always come down physically at their level to have a conversation. I think removing the hierarchies between people, whether as teacher and student or whether as parent and and child, uh, is essential to open up a conversation which is honest and sincere. So do away with the hierarchies, go with reasoning and logic. You don't have to play a dictator. <laughs> you can actually use reason and logic to, to make yeah. sense, to be accepted, to be heard. Yeah. yeah, Lakshmi is asking Shalini that how do we help children not to get lost in the fairy tales and choose meaningful content? What is meaningful content? Oh, you and, know, uh, <laughs> Lakshmi, it's a very interesting question. I'll, I'll just share one thing with you. Uh, with my secondary students and, and, and sort of um, older secondary students, and I've heard when I was sharing this conversation with another person who used to teach at the college level. In fact, she, in her own writing class, had, had dealt with fairy tales. So fairy tales... On the surface, if you think about them, we read them to our younger children, really, really young ones. And we think, oh, it belongs to just a child who is six or four or five. But the reality is fairy tales belong to everyone. In fact, originally fairy tales were written for an adult audience and then they were simplified to, to become uh, something that appealed to the younger audience. Uh, but if you really look at fairy tales, they're very complex mediums of, of, of stories. They're not very simplistic. It is not just the three little pigs. It is the three little pigs talking about a social concern, which is housing. Yes. So I have often used fairy tales as a platform because children are familiar, students are familiar with that um, narrative and led them to think about real world problems, real world issues, and extend them into writing and problem solving and thinking and talking and opening up the dialogue around it. Very, very similar to the, um, to the uh, mythological tales that we find all over the world. Any tale, uh, any tale. Anything, any tale, any folklore, any tale. 
uh, myth based uh, or or just you know like panchatantra tales that we have you know here. we have a vast source of literature that exists in the oral space that is yes. also literature we cannot say that that is not literature that's the oral literature that that exists and india has a large resource when it comes to oral literature almost every old civilization will have a rich range of oral uh, literature to offer and nowadays mm. all of those stories have been animated have been developed have been rewritten readapted so many different things have been done to those stories so why not enjoy them in all those different versions and experience them differently absolutely uh, teacher is writing her uh, she sudha krishna nand uh sudha is saying we are restrained because of a curriculum so how do we bring variety in the forms given in the syllabus and make it interesting could you please ex uh, explain with an example imagine we had to teach robert frost the road not taken i think to young very young kids that's what she's saying young children yeah okay um so at the systemic level of course i answered that question that you know um we should introduce a love for words and sounds before we indulge in in uh, bigger pieces of text but at this level where we are talking about secondary students who've already who are no longer young and who are no longer have the space to go through that journey how can we do that um drama teachers will use long vowel sounds and short vowel sounds to introduce them to the idea of of listening so if you look at a poem uh, we don't just look at figures of speech or imagery to find out whether there's a use of simile or metaphor or so on as personification so on and so forth we also look at what is a very essential ingredient which is sound devices and i think often because uh, teachers themselves are not very confident about sound devices as a medium that they don't go that particular in that direction so often mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if if we begin to uh, understand sound devices a little bit further right it is playing with sounds alliteration the first sound is repeated okay so when we say um, cute cat the k consonant sound at the beginning of the of the phrase is repeated tongue twisters are great examples of alliteration so play with tongue twisters i think as a starter exercise you could do a tongue twister uh, to get them thinking about the alliterative phrase and then when you do a poem which where you are exploring alliteration it becomes easier let's say we're looking at simile um there's a beautiful poem by um michael ondache uh it's called um sweet like a crow it's a fantastic way into similes such an unusual range of similes ondache uses so um you could refer to something like that so i think it's about going that extra mile to find to read yourself as a teacher to extend your reading and then bring that as an example and then when you deal with the bigger text or the or the more mature text it is easier for them to see and identify those things i think a little bit of investment um uh, outside of the curriculum in this space will allow us to help children push through that curriculum faster rather than we yeah. just trying to go again and again over the same thing and then losing the ability to to either create love for that text or to build a passion for for, for the text that they they're working with and I, and i completely understand that that limitation of time i i i understand that completely um but i think it is it is a good investment uh to to work with the basic concepts first and then move on to so you can do it through games so uh, you know for example when um my students worked with uh with figures of speech they were looking at imagery um i and sound devices um uh, 
I got them to create their own games. So some of them created board games. Some of them created um, uh, games that you could play on, on, on a partnered basis or in a group setting. It was just amazing to see how they could just transform. Uh, they had loads of fun when they played those games. Um, yeah. and, and the learning became so solid because here they are going beyond just poetry but using all the poetic devices to have fun. Yeah, we I did something like that. Yeah, we did something like that called the Read Runner. I was talking to you about that, yeah. Shalini. We have a program which is called the Read Runner and we have another program which is called Dram Lit Circle, which is uh, basically, it's a literature circle, but we, um, and this is happening all, online, okay? Because right now COVID, nobody's going yeah. out. So it's working so wonderfully i can't tell you i get phone I calls from parents and I, I i thought that was just the board game amazing amazing <laughs> i think i always feel that play playing is a wonderful way to learn and uh, and it is a it is the only way where you can you know cement your uh, your concepts again and again and again you can just keep working on the same concept and getting to know how whether it is working or not working Time and again, I think um, games uh, and, I mean, and yeah, go on. If I may say something, um, I was thinking yeah. back on what you were saying just now and what Sudha asked in her question, right? Mm -hmm. I think the failure of, of, of us as teachers sometimes, and I have failed often enough. So I'm, I'm saying that as, as one of those people who has also failed uh, many times that now all of us have failed. Yes. Um, sometimes a text that we bring in does not generate that that um, that same love or or enjoyment or excitement. Um, and what could we do to to kind of to support so that there is at least some journeying taking place? I think if you think about this question. To break it down, we need to think about the context in which it will appeal to the student, not to us. So again, coming down to the level of the child. So if your student, for example, likes or, or your group of students like a certain sort of thing, if you could just bring a parallel from the poem into what they like and, and show a relationship there, they will be pulled into the poem. I think, Vashali, you were talking about something yesterday when we were chatting. Uh, you, you mentioned something about your students thinking um, something to do with Shakespeare. You, I can't recall the exact thing, but, but on similar lines, you said that they were so uh, overjoyed. Yeah, about, about the sonnet. About the sonnet. Yeah, yes, uh, I was doing uh, sonnet number five and six, and somewhere, you know, when you read it, read it, uh, at the just at the look of it, it feels that oh, it's such a great you know piece of, po uh, of poetry. You know, uh, it's got such amazing sounds and the way it's been written. Wow, lovely! Uh, the rhyming scheme, this and that. What Shakespeare was saying in those two uh, sonnets was that, "Hello, I love you, and I don't know why you don't want to marry me because you're such a beautiful lady, and please marry me so that we can have children." And then you can have uh, many impressions of your own self, you know, in, in the next generations to come. So it was just an explicit proposal that uh, the poet was making to his mistress. And uh, if you look at it, it's, oh, my God, this is heavy. But if you really go into the, the play of the I words. Think it's a breaking down of information, which, which makes a difference. So yeah. I hope that helps you, Sudha, with, because I, I think if you brainstorm with some more teachers with this. Yes, I think, uh, I think you should uh, brainstorm. And, and yeah. the context of what your children enjoy, you will find something yeah. that, that connects with them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, Shalini, with that, we have come to an end of our conversation. And uh, I hope our viewers have enjoyed this. Um, and uh, I hope to have you again for another conversation, Shalini, because I don't feel satisfied with this conversation. We need to do more of this. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Shalini, for your time. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I had, I had, I had a ball. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, everybody who have tuned in today. Um, and there have been many who have tuned in from outside India. Uh, and uh, I think many of Shalini's friends have also tuned in from Scotland and Glasgow. Uh, so a big hello to everybody. Uh, and a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Keep, uh, keep joining us for our webinars. We uh, do a webinar every weekend. And please go like and subscribe our YouTube channel and also like and uh, like our Instagram and Facebook pages, Joy of Drama. And definitely go to Shalini's uh, Facebook and Insta pages. She writes amazing poetry. Thank you, Shalini. And have a, uh, yeah, it's so I can say good night to you. All right. <laughs> good night. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>